So it's September 9 today, and I am on a 200-acre property in southwest Michigan where I've been working with a landowner for about four years now. And uh, what I want to show you here in this video is it's a part of a 25-acre parcel that he bought on the north end of his property. Uh, about 15 of it was an egg, and the other 10 acres or so is a creek bottom with swamp where the deer always are coming from. So this piece of egg ground was very sandy soil. And the previous owner was just planting hay and sorghum, so really no crops in that field. So there was a big weed problem, and uh, we're slowly transitioning that piece into switchgrass. So you probably remember my last video where I was talking about uh, the property in Wisconsin where the landowner, he didn't want to plant switchgrass, he let it go fallow, and then he's adding pockets of diversity and switchgrass and cedars and bedding and all that good stuff on that property because he has such good soil. That's not going to happen on this property because the soil is way too sandy, uh, a lot of weeds, and it would take forever for this to naturally turn into good buck habitat. So what I want to do is I want to take you on a quick nickel tour of this property. And so from the road, we got this little two track that uh, comes in. We didn't want it to come in straight to the field because of the uh, roadside gawkers that stop. But you can see right here, we have a, a screen of uh, miscanthus grass that we planted two years ago. So <clears throat> this uh, line right here that is along the road, the road is there on the left side, but this line right here goes all the way down about 250 yards and we've got five rows of miscanthus. So a couple years ago in the spring, we tilled it and then the landowner had a guy come in here with a machine and a couple other buddies and they planted a whole row of rhizomes in here. 18 inch centers staggered. So this is the start of it right here. And I'm just gonna take you down this uh, line of miscanthus grass and just kind of show you some of the things that, uh, some of the pitfalls that we ran into and some of the things maybe we could have done better. And then also wanna show you the, uh, the switch grass and show you the progress that we got with that so far. So you can see right here, the. Um, Ground's a little bit lower than what the road is, and you'll see this car go by, but uh, you're gonna see that this is a problem. Not a very good screen, right, to the road, and the reason why is because we got four big walnut trees right here. So, funny thing is, if you, you know, if you know anything about walnuts, it's got a very toxic drip edge. So almost everything that wants to grow under a walnut tree really struggles because of the toxic drip edge. And you can see right here, we've got uh, switchgrass and some weeds that did not even come up all the way around this drip edge. You get past the trees over here and then it picks right back up again. But around the uh, drip edge of them trees, not so much. And the same thing with the miscanthus. We had pretty poor results. So the landowner is thinking about possibly taking these um, walnuts out of here. And uh, then we're just gonna have to pound the ground with uh, brads, you know, plot doctors, uh, calcium, lime, fertilizer. So what happened was uh, last year, you know, we probably only had about a 50% success rate on these miscanthus rhizomes. So then what we did this spring, 12 months later, is we ordered about another 2,500 rhizomes and we hand dug those and put them in the spots where the uh, miscanthus did not come in the first year. So you can see pretty much everywhere we have a flag, we have miscanthus coming up and we got a really good success rate. Here's another flag and here's another uh, miscanthus coming up. You can see right here, another flag, another shoot of miscanthus. So we got a really good success rate despite the, uh, the grass and despite the weeds here. And I think the reason why we had such a good success rate this year, even you know despite the drought that we had in May and June, the reason is is because Brad had us do a root dip before we put them in the ground. And really all that is is a concoction of um, Plot Doctor Dry mixed in water. And we would dip every single rhizome in there before we threw it in the ground. So. We got a much better take on it, and uh, we should have uh, a full screen next year, but by the walnuts, it's just gonna take a while to grow. We got a lot of cool season grass in here. We got a lot of ragweed. 
Um, we got some witch's grass. We got uh, lamb's quarter. We've got horse nettle. We got pretty much almost anything you want to fight. Mare's tails in there. We got pigweed in there. And um, so a lot of competition, but you know, we could have sprayed this with 2,4-D or quinclorac or, you know, a number of other herbicides to try and knock down the competition, but we really didn't want to take a chance on ruining some of the uh, miscanthus rhizomes. So we're going to tackle that next year. We'll probably plant or we'll probably spray, you know, some simazine in the spring. And then uh, the plants will be another year older and they'll probably be able to withstand some of the herbicide if we do a light dose next year. So Palmer pigweed, wow, just going like crazy. Mare's tail. But when you get up to here, you know, we don't have any trees. And so there's no toxic drip edge. And you can see how much better this uh, miscanthus is doing. So we get over here and we got a couple of walnut trees here, but you know, those are elms over there. We got a cherry, so that's no problem. And you can see, you know, with these here, these are good, you know, seven feet tall and a lot thicker. So this is working out great. And uh, now we get to the end of, or get, we get to the corner, this is on the northwest corner of the property. And then we got a cornfield across the property line to the north. Real big, uh, real big cornfield. So that's not always gonna be corn over there. Sometimes that's gonna be soybeans, right? Or that farmer might even put that into, um, into winter wheat some, some year. And so there's just not gonna be any cover over there, right? So that's why we really wanted to get this miscanthus here on the north side as well. And if you look, we've got another 250 yards going along the north line. So we got 250 yards going along the road, going south. And we got another 250 yards. This was 500 yards. That was 5,000 rhizomes. So yeah, it's a lot of rhizomes, but it's gonna be worth it. So the idea here then on this property is this is all gonna be switchgrass. And the reason we want it in the switchgrass is because, well, number one, the, the landowner really didn't want to plant that much food. He wanted more cover on his property. And so what better way to, you know, protect these deer from the road uh, with having a, a line of miscanthus and then having five acres of switchgrass. And then within that switchgrass, we're going to add, you know, strips of winding food plot corridors like clover and chicory. Uh, we're going to plant cedars, probably some spruce. Uh, maybe some pine trees. I mean, we're just gonna we're just gonna throw all kinds of stuff out here in an organized fashion and try and lead deer with edge past some uh, hunting locations. So since this is a little bit more high ground right here, they're probably gonna bed over in this area, and it kind of goes down toward the food out that way. And once you get behind that cornfield over there, then it drops down into the creek bottom, where there's a lot of swamp, a lot of bedding, and uh, we get a lot of deer on camera coming up with uh, black feet, black legs. So, you know, they spend a lot of time out in that swamp. And I'm sure it's not gonna be any different during the hunting season because there's so many brown and down hunters around here that, uh, you know, the pressure is really, really high and it's gonna push a lot of them bucks down into that uh, wet, nasty stuff. So anyway, uh, our switchgrass is coming up good. Now, we planted this on August 15. We wanted to plant it earlier this spring, but uh, you know, we had no rain in May and June, right? We had it all prepped. You know, there was no weeds, we were ready to go, but uh, with absolutely no rain in the forecast, being sandy soil, there was just no way we were gonna take a chance on total failure when we plant switchgrass and sand. So we decided to wait. Um, I asked Roger over at uh, REAP Canada, R-E-A-P Canada. He's the guy that uh, most guys are getting the RC Big Rock from. I asked him, you know, Roger, what's the latest that we can plant switchgrass in southern Michigan in sandy soil? You know, even though the soil is really clean and ready to go, um, he said, he says, hey, if you got, if you got clean soil, which we did, if you got rain coming, which we did, and if you got hot weather coming, which we did, he says you can plant as late as August 21. So we planted on the 15th, and that night it rained. Uh, got a really good soaker. A couple days later it rained again 
and it really worked out well. This, the ground stayed wet for about three, four days. We got really good germination. This is what it looked like on September 1st. After two weeks, we had some really good germination and um, probably got about a you know, half inch to an inch switchgrass. Another thing that helped as well is I put a good dose of Plot Doctor Lime, Calcium, Foliar, and Plot Doctor Dry. So we really tried to make this switchgrass respond into the soil and uh, man, really was really, really happy. You know, we do have a lot of weeds coming up again. That's fine. We've been fighting horse nettle in this plot for so long. It's, uh, it's a real nemesis, but I'll tell you, it's not near as bad as it used to be. So I think we are getting on top of it. But um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you down this north line, going toward the creek, toward the swamp on the east end. And uh, you can see here on, on this side here, it's, we got a much better success rate. We do have some open spots, but you know, every, everywhere you see a flag is where we dropped another rhizome this year and almost every flag has a miscanthus sh shoot coming up. So I think we, uh, we did a lot better this year. The other thing that we did too, just to add a little bit more security from the neighbors, is that uh, we drilled this border here, the first 10 feet in from the miscanthus, we drilled that in twice. So the switchgrass, we used RC Tecumseh, and we, we use that at four pounds per acre. And then we also put in uh, two pounds per acre uh, big blue stem. So that's a total of about six pounds per acre. But again, right here along the border, the first 10 feet just inside the miscanthus, we drilled it twice. So that's going to end up being 12 pounds per acre. And it's going to act more as a border along with the uh, miscanthus. Because we have a serious problem with gawkers out on the road behind me. You know, we get uh, trail cam video of deer way on the opposite end of the field away from the road. All of a sudden these deer are standing at attention. They're looking at the road and then they just hightail it in the woods. Sure enough, you know, what happened is, is somebody stopped on the road looking at the deer feeding out in this field and the deer just took off. Now it happens all year long, you know, it's not just in the fall. So the pressure here is just ridiculous. Hopefully the miscanthus and the switchgrass We'll put an end to that because once they get into this tall switchgrass, those deer are going to disappear. And then you got the uh, border of the miscanthus as well. So it's going to turn, it's going to totally change the whole dynamic of this property. So what used to be a scary place for deer during daylight hours is probably going to be a place now where they're going to want to come and hang out in uh, insecurity. You know, coyotes and bobcats don't operate very well in that switchgrass. And if we've got winding trails of clover and chicory going through there, we've got uh, conifers, you know, cedars, spruce, at uh, clusters of those where they can bed in. I mean, it's just going to be a heck of a, uh, a go-to place. So you can see right here, we've got a lot of white flags because we didn't have very good success rate. But um, now we get to the blind. <clears throat> and uh, we had almost zero success rate in front of this blind area. So what we did is uh, we asked Brad earlier this year if he could, if he could uh, plant some miscanthus rhizomes in pots for us, which he does for several people, and then he'll grow them all summer long, and he'll water them like once or twice a day, so they really have a good start. And then about three weeks ago, I went to his house and I picked them all up, and we planted those in five rows right in front of this blind here. If you're familiar with my videos at all, you know that that blind sitting here is not acceptable at all. I mean, that thing is wide out in the open. So next year, we're probably also going to plant miscanthus along both sides of the blind and probably also on the back side because the neighbors on the other side of the fence there, you know, we've got deer coming out of the, out of the swamp over here and then they just follow that little ravine and then they go up into that food plot over there, uh, the cornfield. So, you know, we've got to be careful on spooking deer on the other side too because deer don't understand boundaries right you know we've got 250 yards this way 250 yards that way and uh this really ought to change a lot of stuff so now what we have here if we look at it at this from the blind we have our corn field right here then we have 10 feet of switchgrass just to the right of the corn field 
Then we got a little bit more solid green, which is my favorite five-way grain blend of oats, rye, peas, crimson clover, and radish. So there's kind of a little bit of a triangle out here. And then we have the uh, switchgrass wraps around between the grains and the miscanthus. We have switchgrass going all the way to the road, and then it turns and goes all the way along the road. So it's about five acres. Uh, well, really about four, four and a half acres of switchgrass on the back side of this corn here. The rye and crimson from last year, we allowed that to go to soluble seed. And wow, we did get a lot of rye, we did get a lot of crimson, but you know, I planted it heavy last year as well. We mowed it down and we came in here and we drilled chicory and red clover because now we want to turn this into a perennial plot. We discovered this past spring that uh, you know, a lot of the deer were leaving because we just didn't have any year-round food. And so we really want year-round food on the property because, you know, we're going to have so much good bedding around here that we want to be able to hold those deer here and have them create or have them use this property and have it become their core area. You know, we're not worried about any doe factory or anything like that. You know, that's just uh, a theory that somebody came up with and it seems like everybody's running with it, right? But uh, we're not worried about that at all. Um, when you have enough bedding, you have hinge cut bedding, you have switchgrass bedding, you have swamp bedding, you're going to have a lot of deer. You better have some food on the property during the spring and the summer if you're going to keep those deer around. So we have a lot of bucks and does on the property at the same time all summer long. It's uh, just a fallacy that does chase the bucks off the property. So anyway, we've got them here all year long. The other thing I just wanted to show you a minute and uh, I don't know if you can see, but I've got, I've got a trail camera on the uh, platform there by the blind. I got that thing down there in video mode, so we'll see what that looks like. But if we look out of the, uh, out of the blind, right down there, we've got a little plot that we opened up this year. We call that the valley plot. It goes out into the swamp, muddy, black muck, a creek going through there. Lots of high humps, some tamaracks. I mean, it's just great, great mature buck cover down in there. And we get a lot of good video and pictures of deer using that plot. Now, we planted clover and chicory in there uh, earlier this year. Boy, that's, that soil is so poor that I just ran over it again today with some more Brad Harper's Plot Doctor Lime, Calcium, and Foliar. So... Then I also reseeded it again because uh, we, we just want that to come in nice and thick. Now before we move on, I want to explain the strategy behind this habitat plan because there are several things going on here that the casual observer might not notice. And that is when my client bought this property, it was wide open to the road, which is over here on the west side. And so like you saw in that video clip, we had deer feeding up here on this high ground and we had this camera sitting over here by the yellow dot. And that's when you saw the deer running down into the woods, even though these cars were stopped 200 yards away. So there's no way we, we're going to be able to get any deer to want to feed out here if we even we had the best food plot in the whole county. The fact that there's very high pressure around here was not going to allow them deer to stay out there on that wide open field. So first thing we did like you saw is we put the miscanthus line over here on the west side and on the north side and then we have the switchgrass inside from that and remember right along the first 10 feet we drilled that twice so that's doubled but the rest of the switchgrass is going to be for bedding at around six pounds per acre so all the yellow is switchgrass then we have our little triangle of grains we have a little strip of switchgrass going down here that's 10 feet wide then we have our cornfield, our clover chicory, which is going to be our perennial plot. And then we have our little, what I call the valley plot down here. Now, from down here in the swamp, going uphill into the clover chicory is about a 50-foot elevation change. So this is uh, quite a hill walking up here. And we've noticed that these deer really like hanging close to the swamp. They can't be seen by the road when they're down in here. And, but the problem was there was no food down in this area. So that's why we added this little valley plot. And with the blind right here on the north side, you can easily see right down into the valley plot. And uh, looking back, you can easily see the blind. Now, we had some trees and bushes and autumn olives uh, in this line of sight here, which we had to cut out. 
We've got a couple of mock scrapes in here. Uh, we're going to be adding a water hole. Uh, we're going to be adding some crab apple fruit trees, which we did not get to yet this year. That'll uh, come next year. And yes, even though this is a swamp and there's standing water down in here in some spots, you'll be surprised how many deer will walk through flooded timber, get out to a food plot, and still drink out of a water hole. From this blind, which is going to be behind Miscanthus, this blind will be a non-factor to those mature bucks. And the fact that my client is a gun hunter at the moment, he is going to get into bow hunting eventually, but because his kids are uh, getting older and getting to that age. But as of right now, him and his kids are just gun hunting, and uh, this will be an easy about 150-yard shot right down into uh, this little valley plot. And this, I think, is where his highest percentage of opportunity is going to be to take a mature buck. Because when they come out of this uh, swamp bedding in here, they're going to be walking into the wind, which most of the time is going to be coming out of the west. So they'll be walking into the wind, getting up into the food, which is a safe scenario with them. And the fact that this blind is over here on the extreme north end, you can hunt this with almost any wind except for anything north, right? Because the scent's going to be going into the property here. And this field to the north of the blind you saw was just a big fallow field which by the time we get to gun hunting, a lot of that cover is going to be laying down and probably not going to see any deer in this field close to the blind. And he's going to be able to walk in from the road behind the miscanthus grass. And these deer could be anywhere close to that miscanthus, but yet they're not going to be able to see him once this miscanthus fills in after a couple of years. And he'll be able to slip right in and get into that blind. And even if this all fills up with deer at the end of the uh, evening, he can still slip out of here and uh, get out of Dodge without busting this property. Now, the other strategy behind this cornfield being right here in this shape in the middle is the fact that because this is going to become good habitat for deer after a few years, because we're going to have clusters of pine and spruce, which is going to take a few years longer than that yet, we're going to have little trails of clover and chicory going through. Now, this might not end up be looking exactly like this because of terrain features and all that, but it's, it's kind of a good base to start with. But between that and the clusters of spruce and pine, we're probably going to add some pockets of uh, forbs and forage from uh, John at Northwoods just to give some variety. This is going to become quite the habitat for deer to hang around during daylight. And if the does are going to be bedding in here close to the food, well, these bucks that are going to be down here in the swamp are going to want to chuck for does in the switchgrass area, right? So the idea behind this is, is as bucks come out of the swamp bedding and they hit the valley plot, they're going to be exposed to the landowner. And if the landowner doesn't get a shot at them here, then as they come up the hill, they expose themselves into the clover chicory, which is also short crops. And if he doesn't get a shot at them here and they cross the corn and this strip of switchgrass here, now they're in short crops as the grains. So these bucks, in order to get from the swamp bedding to the switchgrass bedding where the does will be, they got to expose themselves three times to the landowner's shotgun. So that's the idea behind it because these bucks will end up going out into the switchgrass looking for hot estrus does. And if we can sweeten the pot here, you know, with some more fruit trees, we got a water hole, and the habitat just continues to grow over time with these pine and spruce, which is going to be bedding pockets. His opportunities every year are really going to skyrocket. Now, one thing that we're thinking about doing next year in this corn section and the grain section, we just might be planting corn in 60 inch wide rows. So that way we don't have to separate the grains and the corn. So in other words, we're gonna be planting rows of corn 60 inches apart and then between the corn rows, we can plant grains or we can plant soybeans. And if the corn and the soybeans are both Liberty ready, we can spray all the corn and all the beans with Liberty being careful not to spray the switchgrass strip in the middle, right? But what that will do is the landowner will be able to see down most of the 60-inch corn rows. And if you've got corn that's 8 to 9 feet tall, those bucks will gladly come out of bedding and come into this corn where they can feast on brassicas or soybeans in the security of the corn and feel as though they're not being exposed. So that's going to allow us to throw more food at the deer, more security at the deer while they're feeding, 
And then the following year, all we have to do is just move those corn rows over 30 inches, right? Because if they're at 60 and we plant right in the middle between the two the next year, and then that way we can do this every single year. So just something to think about if you guys are planting corn, that might be your ticket for planting corn every year without having to put something else in that spot instead. So what I want to do right now is um, we're going to walk along this uh, cornfield here and I'll just kind of show you what we got going on with this cornfield. Right here, it doesn't look very good at all. Uh, we planted this cornfield on first day of summer, June 21, way too late. And one thing I'll tell you is, um, you know, if you're planting corn for production, right, you're trying to get as many bushels per acre, you really don't want to use a Genesis drill. It's um, not really made for planting corn, but when it's for deer, and we don't really care about the high percentage of uh, corn production, a Genesis will work just fine. So we've got a lot of ears in there. This is probably the worst looking corn uh, in this whole area here. This is, uh, I think this is about a one acre cornfield. When we get to the other side, the corn is a lot deeper green. Uh, the ears are much bigger. I'll just show you right here. We've got uh, what our switchgrass looks like. So you can see it right here. It's about up though, inch and a half, maybe two inches in some spots. There's some that's probably, you know, three, four inches. But yeah, it, uh, I'm really, really happy with it. I'm not too worried about the weeds. We'll deal with that next spring. But we have liftoff, and so it's gonna be a big jump on the height of the switchgrass next year because we planted it this fall instead of waiting until next spring. And then you can see from here to the right, that's the five-way grain blend. And I got an exclusion cage over there. I cannot believe the difference in the height inside that exclusion cage already. So there's a lot of mouths out here on this property. They're already hitting it pretty hard. A lot of the rye is, rye and oats are nipped off flat on top. So here we're getting into a little bit better corn. And so because this is Roundup Ready and Liberty Ready corn, about the middle of July, I came in and sprayed all this with uh, with the herbicide but plus I put Brad's foliar in the uh, mix as well and put them on at the same time so what Brad has discovered when you put that foliar on the plants it really makes that plant want to drink that uh, solution in but then if you have herbicide in it at the same time it does a much better job at killing it it's almost like putting you know a bunch of AMS or ammonium sulfate in the solution as well so you can see we've got uh, a lot of horse nettle. Very, very typical of what that looks like. Very hard to kill. So are we ever gonna be able to get rid of this horse nettle? Um, probably not, but at least we can reduce it so that it's not the uh, extreme problem that it was before. But here's, a, here's one of the reasons why horse nettle is so hard to kill. What we have here is a dead horse nettle plant. You can see all the thorns on it. So we have this dead plant, but then we got a new green one coming right out of it because it's actually a rhizome in the ground. And it uh, will send up a new shoot even though the plant above ground is dead. So really, really frustrating. Here's another way you can tell horse nettle. Here's a dead one. It did not send up another new one, but it's got the little yellow berries on it. That's a dead giveaway of what horse nettle is. And they got all the thorns on it. So. It, uh, if you're ever going to pull those out of the ground, you better be wearing gloves because they will tear you right up. But uh, over here, we'll check out the corn. And uh, we'll look at some of these ears here. See what we got. Several of these stalks have, you know, more than one, one ear of corn on it. We got one here with two. You know, we got really tasseling out, dropping a lot of pollen. You know, some, some good sized ones in here. Another plant with two. But uh, you can see on the ground, there's a lot of, a lot of horse nettle in this uh, cornfield. Yeah, we're gonna get a lot of food out of here. We're gonna leave it standing, obviously. And uh, we just might brush hog some shooting lanes in here come gun season. So we'll see how that goes. When it was young, they just mowed it right down so it never really recovered. 
So now we're on the other end. The blind is way over on the other side. And uh, this is where we drilled in the red clover and the chicory to become a perennial plot. And you can see we've got some uh, red clover and chicory that are coming up in the rows that the drill put in the ground. So it is coming. The other thing that we're going to do here is we want to sink a big telephone pole in the ground right over here somewhere where we've got some sun, right? Because uh, we're going to have a trail camera up on that pole with a solar panel. And, you know, we just can't have it in here by the trees. And there is really no good tree to put a camera up. So we're going to just sink a telephone pole. We're going to auger one down, drop it in there. And then the camera will be up there at around 15 feet. And it'll be able, because the ground is lower, that's why we want to get it up a little bit higher. But then it'll be able to see up on this hill. And it's going to be one of those real link cameras. You know, we'll pan, tilt, and zoom. You can also view the plot in live video mode anytime you want, 24 seven, from anywhere in the world, as long as you got an internet connection. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, I really do think that real links are absolutely made for food plots. And uh, inside the woods though, where it's you know, a lot of cover, I really prefer Tacticam. So those are my two favorite cameras at this point. Be able to just to check food plots anytime you want with a live view on demand. And be able to tilt and zoom, pan back and forth. You can actually follow deer walking across a food plot just with the controls on your phone, you can make that uh, camera turn. So quite a bit of fun with that. So this field looks quite a bit different than it did, you know, about a month ago when it was completely bare dirt. And a week ago, you could barely see the, the switchgrass and the weeds coming up. And uh, here we are a week later again, and wow, what a difference, you know? I mean, you can really see the switchgrass is really doing well. So we've got these rows. And then we also have uh, the big blue stem as well. So like I said in my previous video, planting four to five acres of switchgrass may not be for everybody. You know, there's a lot of prep work involved. There's time and money and dedication into uh, making sure you do it right, you know. And uh, a lot of guys don't have the patience either because switchgrass can be very frustrating. But I will say with the new RC line of uh, switchgrass that uh, it does come up a lot faster and it just makes it so much easier to establish a switchgrass field. But even then, uh, you know, some guys do have better soil like the property did in Wisconsin. And, you know, at that point, it's, it's much easier to just let it go fallow and then just add pockets to switchgrass and other things that you want to have in there, like, you know, conifers for bedding and whatnot. So, but in this situation, that was never going to happen. So we wanted to start out with a good base of cover, which is a switchgrass, and then we'll add the other pockets inside the switchgrass after that. So anyway, if you got anything out of this video, Give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you on the next video.